Good morning. I'd like to welcome folks in as you're coming in. We have the choir coming in. And um, I know it's Thanksgiving weekend, a lot of things going on. Um, but it's so good to see you here today. If you're visiting with us, hope you feel like a welcome guest. If you're a member, welcome back home. If you look at the end of your pews, there's a friendship register. It's a little black book. If you would, put your name down there. If you're a visitor, give us a little more information. If you're a member and some things have changed, such as contact information or things like that, please put that down there as well. This is a great way for us to keep um, up with things. Also, if you know of a prayer need, if you know of a ministry need, please put that in as well. Again, um, it's good to see you at worship this morning, and we've got a few announcements to cover with you. Um, first of all, you'll see at least one, maybe two inserts in your bulletin that have to do with Lottie Moon. This is Lottie Moon time. It's going to be a very great time for our church, a chance to give to missions throughout the world. And I um, want you to be a part of that. Also, um, one of the things with that is next Sunday... Often for Lottie Moon, we bring in missionaries who have served. Next Sunday, we're going to bring in some folks who were led to Christ, who, who were, are now leaders of the church because of the work of our International Mission Board missionaries. And so you get to hear from them about the work that's being done on the field. And that's, that's very, very important. Now, some people said that the star is crooked. Okay? Everybody's looking at that. We did that just to throw you off. But, um, no, we just haven't finished tying it straight with the lights and stuff. But you know what would be much worse than a crooked star? If you did the crooked thing of having living Christmas tree tickets in your possession that you don't need. And as a result, people that could be here to hear the gospel are at home. And the tickets are handed to the ushers when you walk in and say, Oh, I didn't need these if someone comes up. So if you have living Christmas tree tickets that you're going to use, Fantastic. If you have some living Christmas tree tickets that you don't need to use, please bring them back. I think the only time that's left available is Thursday. It may be. So if you have living Christmas tree tickets that you're not going to use, please bring them back. Okay? And we will get those to the very, very long waiting list. And also, if you are a part of our student ministry, either a student or a parent, or you have been part of our student ministry over the years. On December 15th, we're going to do a drop-in of those um, connected with our student ministry at my house. It's also known as the Betsy Farmer Food Fest. She's already started with the homemade candy. We've had uh, 80 to 100 the last couple times we've done that. It'll be December 15th. You're welcome to come to it. Um, if you have any questions, you can see Betsy or myself. But looking forward to a time for this segment of our church that's been a part of our ministry over the years just to be a part of that fellowship. Now we've got an important business item to take care of, so Neil, would you come at this time, please? Good morning. Uh, first, let me, to, uh, let me welcome all the visitors this morning, and at the same, in the same breath, just say we apologize for having you take your time with uh, a quick uh, couple of items of business, but we appreciate your indulgence in doing, in doing so. Um, let me call this, this session to order. And uh, first, let me ask if all church members, all church members, do you have a ballot? If not, raise your hand. Ushers? Ushers? We've got several hands up here. Hold your hands high so they can see. There's one upstairs, two upstairs. I think we're not, we've got one more upstairs, gentlemen. If somebody wants to go up there, over to my left. We got some down here, down front. Uh, we've got a couple over here. Um, Okay, anybody else that does not have, we got one more right here.
Anybody else that does not have a ballot? Everybody upstairs get one? Okay, perfect. Uh, what you'll see on this ballot are three items of business. Uh, the first one is the, the deacon affirmation. You'll see the list of deacons that uh, are being proposed this morning. Uh, the, it's a simple I affirm or I do not affirm that list uh, with the check mark. Uh, Human Resource Council election at large, at large member. Uh, and there are three names listed there. Please circle one of those names or write in uh, the name that you would like uh, in the, in the write-in blank provided. And uh, the last item of business here is the 2020 budget. The budget was presented uh, by the trustees and the uh, finance committee two weeks ago at our regularly scheduled um, quarterly meeting and uh, across the street, it was discussed and review, uh, reviewed and discussed that evening. Questions were asked, answered uh, to everybody's satisfaction. The motion was made to present it to the congregation. And uh, the vote is to, is, was to have taken place two weeks later, which is today. So that's why we're here. And uh, so the, if you will just mark i affirm the uh 22 or 2022 mission uh, ministry i can't even read this morning uh ministry budget or i do not confirm the budget that will take care of all of our items of business uh, again i appreciate your uh, visitors i appreciate your time and indulgence uh, members i do appreciate your participation and uh at this time i will declare this meeting adjourned and at the end of the service, there'll be ushers at the exits with a basket for you to put them in. Please don't put them in the offering plate. Um, hand them to there. Also, I want to remind you, in your bulletin, there's a lot of good info. So please look at that. Now let's do one of my favorite things in worship. Stand up and greet. grateful for your presence with us today. Lord, you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Lord, we come before you and we ask you by your Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and our minds. Lord, help us to lay aside any distraction that would keep us from fixing our eyes on you. Lord, we love you. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Come, let us adore him, for he is Christ the Lord. Please join with us in singing hymn 89. O come, all you faithful. <laughs>
seated. Our first reading today is from Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, he will rule over us, and he will be called Wonderful Advisor and Mighty God. He will also be called Father who lives forever and Prince who brings peace. There will be no limit to how great his authority is. The peace he brings will never end. He will rule on David's throne and over his kingdom. He will make the kingdom strong and secure. His rule will be based on what is fair and right. It will last forever. The Lord's great love will make sure that happens. He rules over all. The next reading is from John 14, verse 27. I leave my peace with you. I give my peace to you. I do not give it to you as the world does. I do not let, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid.
Would you join with us now? Singing hymn 93, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Please stand once more as we sing. Wouldn't it be nice if the world in silence, stillness, the world is not silent, it's not still. We're not even still and silent in here sometimes in our own hearts. We are here for ourselves, but we are also here for those outside this building and outside this community. We're here for the whole world. Wouldn't it be nice if this year we could celebrate Christmas all over the world with everybody everywhere? May we pray. Father, we are grateful that you brought us here, but we are grateful that you always give us the sound of silence to hear your call and to hear the angels sing. We come here this morning offering ourselves, our resources to you. We are reminded of those people around us and those people in foreign lands that need us so much. Father, during this time, offering our resources, our time, our talents, we also offer our treasures. For it's in Christ's name we pray, and it's in his name we give. Amen. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there. Now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. 
We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. I served for a year in East Asia and sharing the gospel. I served in East Asia for one year as a missionary. I wanted to experience something new, so I decided to go to overseas. 한국의 젊은이들은 찾고 있어요. 그들이 일할 기회를. 이 프로그램을 통해서 그들의 삶이 완전히 뒤바뀌었습니다. IMB 선교사로서 우리는 이 청년들에게 예수 그리스도를 증거하는 훈련을 시킵니다. 이들은 집중 훈련을 통해서 6개월, 1년 동안 그곳에서 IMB 선교사 함께 협력 사역을 합니다. The unforgettable moment was watching a new friend to surrender to God and being baptized. She began to cry when he shared the gospel about Jesus Christ, and then she received Jesus as Lord. I met one friend, and she didn't heard the gospel before, so I felt really very sad. I met a friend in English Corner, and I shared my testimony, and he received. Jesus is uh, his Lord. I shared the gospel with a man for six months and he finally accepted Jesus. 이 청년들이 많은 결실을 맺지 못한다 할지라도 그곳에서 선교사로서의 경험을 하고 돌아옵니다. 돌아온 후에 복음 증거의 열정을 회복하고 혹은 풀타임 사역자로 헌신하기도 합니다. It was great experience. It taught me a lot of humility. It taught me how to share the gospel to my friends and my co-workers. I found my calling to join seminary and be a pastor so that I can serve people and tell the gospel to the people full time. Through this experience, now I want to be a missionary. 미국의 성도들의 라디문 성교 성, 성탄 헌금을 통해서 한국의 청년들이 그리스도의 제자로 훈련받고 그리고 복음으로 재무장합니다. 이것이 바로 전 세계를 향한 우리의 협력 사역입니다. 이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
known as. Now, the movie was not a birth-to-death kind of story about Mr. Rogers. In fact, it was really two stories. The story of Mr. Rogers and his television program, but also what you saw in the story was a man by the name of Lloyd Vogel. Lloyd was a pessimistic, cynical man who, because of his relationship with his fathers and other things that he had seen in the newspaper business, became very jaded toward life. He got the assignment of going to interview Mr. Rogers. Of all people, an investigative reporter got this assignment to investigate, of all people, sweet, nice, gentle Mr. Rogers. So he decides to go in and talk to Mr. Rogers, knowing that he could not be the man that he was on television. Nobody could be that good, that often, that deeply. <clears throat> well, the story goes that actually Mr. Vogel's life changed because of what he experienced in the presence of this very gentle man, Mr. Rogers. Now, it's interesting. If you remember the story and most of us remember it well, the programs, it dealt with some very complex issues. Birth, death, divorce, injustice, poverty. But in the context of gentleness and goodness and even love. Gentleness, goodness, and love. Doesn't that sound familiar to you? Doesn't that sound like somebody we talk about here? Now, we need to turn to the scripture because I do want to ask a question that maybe is not in the Bible, but it's implied by the Bible. Now, the Bible talks a great deal about friendship and about neighborness. Remember, the scribe came up and asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And that gave rise to a great story, the most popular story and the most radical story that Jesus told, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't want to deal so much with who is my neighbor. Jesus did a good job with that. But I want to talk about where is my neighborhood? Where is your neighborhood? Where is your neighbor? And I want to go to the Bible to get some indication about what the Bible says about where our neighborhood is. And to get that context, I want you to turn to Ephesians, the letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus, chapter 1. Should be easy to find. My page is 1242. I don't know what your page is going to be, depending on what version you use. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. My translation is going to be a little bit different. But I would ask, if you are able, would you stand in reverence and honor of the scripture being read? Hear now the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, and I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, that's you, and his incomparable great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms far above all the rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is ever said and that can ever be said, both now and in all the nows to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, and this is for you, which is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Word of God for the people of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God. Amen. You may be seated. Now let's take a quick look, if you will, with some of the phrases that you see in your scripture. And I want you to keep your Bible open. There are some copies of the scripture in the pews in front of you, just in case you think I'm not telling you the truth, because this is dynamite. What I'm going to tell you this morning will rock your world. It's supposed to do that, but it's always been there. Let me remind you of some phrase. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now for the Hebrew person, 
uh, people are divided into three different parts. The mind, the heart, and the, well, I don't want to be indelicate, but it's your gut. Mind, heart, and gut. Your mind is the seat of your uh, cognitive abilities. Your heart is the seat of your emotions. And your gut is your isness. That's where you have your intuition. And that's where you make a lot of decisions from is this right down here. It's where your soul is kept. Now, notice in this verse, Paul talks about, and he speaks to all three of those parts of us. You know the hope that he's called you to. You use your mind and you know that. You feel the riches of his glorious inheritance in your heart. You feel it here. And you're acting upon an incomparable great power. Your gut, your body, your action, your mind, your heart, and your action are all spoken to here. They're all invited to understand the gifts of God that you already have. Now, to follow this sermon, from here on out, you're going to need two things. You're going to need a writing instrument and something to write on. So if you'll get out your copy of the worship guide, or you, if you have a notebook, or if you're really good, I'll let you write in your Bibles. It's okay, because what I'm going to tell you is Bible stuff. In fact, it'll make the Bible come alive. So there are three things I want to bring out. If you'll do that, I'd appreciate that. Now, those three things, your mind, your heart, and your gut, are not one of those three things. But I want you to remember today just nine words, three sets of three words. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that simple? Don't you think we can hold that in our hearts? I think so. Now, God has three gifts for us all, all individually and certainly all together. It's what we in the South call the y'all of the congregation. He does this. He tells us about these three gifts in the three couplets that you see before you in the scripture in verse 19. He says he, we have three gifts for us from God. First of all, in verse 19, he says, you have great power for us. He has given us for us from God the gift of power. The word that the Greek is used there is the same word that we get from the word dynamite. It's explosive power. It's the power that we can have right now and tomorrow and all of life's tomorrows. Every moment, every day, every time. Every moment, every day, every time. Now, that's not one of the three-word three word phrases either. But I want you to understand that we all have access to that power. In fact, he says, you have authority power, and dominion. In the present age, we have it right here, right now among us. You have it today. You had it this morning. You had it yesterday. You have the power of God, the dynamite of God inside of you. You have that option anytime you'd like to use it. It's given to you. In fact, not only do you have it today, we have the authority, the power, dominion over all things we're going to go through. Anything that you're going to go through today, you already have the power to overcome it in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good news? And then he says you have the authority, the power, and dominion in the age to come. Now, I don't know about you, but the age to come for me starts this afternoon. And tomorrow, and all life's tomorrows. That's the age to come for me. So the Bible is telling me that through the power and authority and dominion that God has given me as a child of Him, that I can overcome anything that the world gives me. Any sort of trial or tribulation, you and I can overcome. Because if I can't overcome it, I turn to you to help me. Just like I turn to you to help me sing that song. And what a marvelous song it was to remind us that we're all called to be together in one neighborhood. The authority in all of life's tomorrow. The tomorrow that only he knows that we're going to face. In all of life, there are predictable changes. Sometimes there's marriage, there's birth sometimes, and there's death sometimes. Those are predictable changes. But our life is full of abnormal changes, unpredictable changes, changes that we can't imagine are going to happen, and they will happen in our life. We even have power over those things. 
And then the Bible says he placed all things under his feet. Now, the feet in the Hebrew uh, anthropology is the lowest part of the humanity. He has put everything under this earth, in this earth, under Jesus' feet. The lowest part, this earthly nature, the dirt. And he has appointed him to be the head over everything. The head is man's crown and glory. He says he will cover you from the head to your toe with his protection, his power, his dominion. In fact, and he gives to his body, this is you, and this is what you'll need to write, by the way. He gives his body three invitations. The fullness of him. He gives us his fullness. The fullness of God. I'll let you write. Then he says, to him who fills everything, the fullness of God, who will fill everything in every way. So here are the three words, phrases I want you to write. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now let me stop and ask you a question. Are you living out the fullness of God? Yeah. Are we seeing God filling every moment of our lives, the good times and those times that are struggle, those times of trial, those times of heartache and heartbreak? Is the church filling the world with the good news in every way? That's God's invitation. That's God's plan. That is God's command. Would you like to see what that looks like? Let's use our imagination for just a minute. Suppose I had a big jar up here and I filled it full of big rocks. Big rocks and filled it up to the very top with big rocks. Would that jar be full? No, nah, wouldn't be full. Let's suppose I put some smaller rocks in that jar and put them everywhere I could. Would that jar be full? No. no. Let's suppose we put some sand in there. After all, sand is just little rocks. Let's suppose we put that in. Would that jar be full? What are some other things that we could fill that jar with? What are some other things like that? Anything in the world. Let's suppose we put all that in. That's what the Bible says when he says, fill every nook and cranny with the presence of God. Everything in that jar, every space that could be given to anything, no matter how big or small, was taken up. That's what the Bible promises that God should do. His fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Can you imagine what that looks like? Can you imagine what that feels like? And what does this passage mean? What can we take away from this passage? It means that everything we can have everything God has for everything we need in every possible way we might need it. Now that is good news. Everything God has for everything we need in every possible way we might need it. And does a good neighbor share the good news in their neighborhood? Well, certainly they do. And how do we do that? Let's look at three more words. And this, these three words give us the situations that God works in. Write these words down. Everyone, everywhere, in every way. I see some of you are not writing. I suppose that you have memorized these words already. Everyone, everywhere, in every way. Now, who is this everyone? Well, it's everybody. It's us, but it's also them. It's those who agree with us, but it's also those who have other opinions. It is those who believe like us and those who cannot even understand, imagine what we believe. That's the everybody. That's the everyone. It is every person who walks in our door and every person who walks down our street and every person we saw in the video and the people that they see and beyond that. Everybody is everybody who carries with them the image of God. It's everybody who's made in the likeness of God. It's everybody who's created 
as one of God's masterpiece. Everybody you meet is God's masterpiece. Whether they know it or not, or whether we know it or not. Now, where's this everywhere? Well, it's all places. It's everywhere. It's here, but it's there. It's in our homes, with our families. It's across the world with people who live in straw huts with mud roofs and mud floors whose names we can't even pronounce. It's in a community of folks like us and it's villages across the globe in places we may never go or we may never know. It's in the thousands, uh, countless faceless, homeless, voiceless, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters who don't know or maybe who have never heard that they have a father that loves them more than they'll ever know. They have a family larger that welcomes them in every place they might go. And they have a feel to which they're called to invest their life. Yes, they are loved, they belong, and their lives matter. Now that is very good news. Would you like to feel what that good news sounds like? Now take your arms. Come on now, take your arms. I know the Bible says being childish is the quickest way to avoid uh, the responsibility, but being childlike is the only way to get to the kingdom. Now here's what I'd like for you to do. Everybody, I want you to see your arms. Don't make me come down there. I want you to take your arms and wrap yourself up in your arms so tight. Tighter than you can imagine. That feels good, doesn't it? Feels funny, but it feels good. Now, spread your arms out as far as you can. Open your arms up wide. Much better, yes? More risky? More vulnerable? More, more like Jesus. Now, are you ready with your pens and paper? A final group of three words I want to ask you about. Three actions that I want you to take to complete this sermon. This sermon will not be over when I end in just a minute. It will go on wherever you go. Three words. To know. K-N-O-W. To go. And to show. To know. To go. And to show. First of all, to know. I want you to learn as much as you can about all the different people in your world, in your neighborhood, as large as it is. But I also want you to find out your own talents, to know yourself, to know your gifts and your talents, what God has given you. And then I want you to be able to connect those two. I want you to take the world's needs. Now, here's the world's needs. If you hold up your pointer finger like this on your left hand and crook it at the very end. That's the world's needs. And I want you to take this pointer finger on your right hand and curve it too. That's your abilities and talents. And I want you to bring those together like that. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that is, Kathy? It's the symbol for friend in American Sign Language. I want you to be friends with the world. Take the world's needs and your gifts and talents and bring them together and becomes what the Bible uses the great word that we throw around so much, I want you to become friends and neighbors. Then I want you to go to find your neighborhood. Maybe it's in a foreign land, maybe it's another country. Our church offers trips around here, in this country, in this state, and around the world. And I want you to go to some of those. But it must start right here, right now, in your home, in your neighborhood at your work, at your school, wherever you are. And don't be surprised, by the way, if your neighborhood gets bigger, just like your heart is going to get. Would you like to know what it is to show how you feel about that big neighborhood you live in? Here's what I want you to do when you go home. I want you to take a globe or a map, and I want you to spin the globe or use the map and just shut your eyes and move your hands over the map and let them rest in one place. Put a finger in one place. Open your eyes and name that place. 
And then after you name that place, I want you to find out everything you can about what that place is. The people, their needs, their abilities, their relationship with God, what their families look like, what language they speak. I want you to learn as much so, I, so you can pray for them. And I want you to say a prayer like this. God, I pray for the people of this land. You know their needs. Fill them with all your fullness in whatever ways they need you, in whatever ways only you know. And then, this is the hard part. I want you to open your wallet, your pocketbook, or your piggy bank. And I want you to think of this. If God in all his fullness, in every need, and in every way we need it, will fulfill our needs, what am I going to do? What am I willing, willing to give to my neighbors? We'll talk about three ways to give in the weeks to come in this uh, international mission emphasis. Giving of your time, your talent, and your treasures. But right now, there are already people who are working in those places that you probably put your finger, and they need your help. They need your money right now. They're already over there. Now, as far as we're concerned this morning, let's review what we've talked about. We first have three invitations, and you've written them down. The fullness of Him who fills everything in every way we need it. Fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Did you get that? The second, we have three situations. Everyone, everywhere, in every way. Everyone, everywhere, in every way. Are you becoming overwhelmed yet? You should be. This is overwhelming. We have to take all of God into everywhere. We have to give the fullness of God, pass that on to everywhere, every way, and every person. It's more than we can do. Lastly, we have three actions. To know, to go, and to show. What does that in every way really mean? It means in every way you can imagine. In every way you can't possibly dream of right now. And in every way that's been done in the past. And every way God can do it in the future. It's every way we've grown accustomed to. That we're comfortable in doing. It's all the ways the Father will call us into His divine uncomfortableness that will scare us to death. It's every way that we can plan. It's every way we can afford. And it's every way that we can do. And it's in every way too big for our plans, too costly for our budgets, and too God-sized that we cannot possibly even think about it except in His will and His strength. The fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. And what are the steps that you and I need to take to receive all that He has all that we, for all that we need and allow God to fill everything in every way. Everyone. Everywhere. In every way. May I share a story with you at this time? Bill Davis and his wife Mary were two of the people who found God in the uh, emphasis million more in 54. Some of us remember that. Some of us weren't quite born about that time, but some of us remember that. It was a great revival emphasis of the Southern Baptists throughout the country. A million more in 54. They were two. Sam, uh, Bill was a welder. Now, there went some months after his conversion that Bill read the scripture and he prayed and he felt the call into the ministry. But there was only one problem with Bill. He had never finished grade school. He had not taken a chance on the sixth grade. So he goes with his wife and little family takes them away from a good job, a neighborhood that they knew, to Clear Creek Baptist College in Pineville, Kentucky, 
Some of us know exactly where Pineville, Kentucky is, and some of us go there, have been there every year. They go up to Pineville, Kentucky, and he takes a 90% decrease in his salary to go. There were some times that Bill couldn't even afford food, and every meal was an exciting adventure because they didn't know what they were going to eat or if they were going to eat. Bill only had a fifth grade education. And yet Bill was invited to speak to churches like this, neighborhoods like you all. And he came in, and because of his excitement and his great creativity, people came to know the Lord with this man who knew very little, had very little formal education. And he went all over rural Kentucky and all over rural Indiana and started these churches, but that's not all of the story. He retired some years later in the 90s, early 90s, and he moved to Texas to go fishing. You always get the best fish in Texas, the country of Texas. And so he goes down to Texas. All he wants to do is rest and relax and fish. And somebody came up and said, I need you to go to Romania with me. He didn't even know where Romania was. Somebody had to show him on the map that he couldn't read, by the way. So they took him to Romania, and guess what happened? He went to Romania, and he got so excited about sharing the good news that we've just talked about that he shared it in homes and families one at a time, little group after little group after little group after little group. And then he left after two weeks. And on the plane, he looked out the window and saw the little villages that he left and remembered the faces of those that were left behind. And he decided he'd go back and not leave them like sheep without a shepherd. So Bill goes back in about a year and he begins to work. And with his creativity, he creates a new program of evangelism and discipleship just for these people. And he goes back into the homes here and the homes there and the villages and things like that. Four years later, there were a hundred churches that this man who could not even read set apart. Now that is really, really good news. I started today with the question, where is your neighborhood? Some of us aren't quite sure where our neighborhood is. Maybe it's just right here. Maybe it's a little bit wider. Maybe it's our homes and our families. Maybe it's down the streets. Maybe it's our schools. Maybe it's another city. Maybe it's somewhere across the world. And maybe when we look at ourselves, we don't think we have any more abilities than Bill had. But there's something you have to know about God. He takes something, nothing, and makes something. He gives hope when there is no hope. He takes our death and puts in his life. That is the best news of all. So today, let me ask you a question in closing. How big is your neighborhood? Could you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be their neighbor? Father, in these words, we ask you to inhabit these words in our spirits. We ask you to move in these words as you moved across the dead bones in the book of Ezekiel. We ask you to be in these words to calm the storms inside of us. We thank you, God, for the opportunities, the invitation, and the places and the things you have given us to become all that we can for all that you are. God, in these moments, help us be responsive and responsible to the word that you have given us and has dwelled in our hearts for many, many years. For it's in Christ's name we pray, and it's in Christ's name we live. Amen. Who is your neighbor? You know that one. Where's your neighborhood? Hopefully you'll find that out pretty soon. Let me give you a hint. It's much larger than you think. I invite you in this invitation to participate in the kingdom of God in a way you've never done before. 
I'll ask you to participate in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God by your actions, by your decisions, by your mind, your heart, and your, act, and your body. You're called in this time to participate in the kingdom. As we sing the final hymn, the hymn of commitment and dedication, would you think, would you pray, would you move? May we sing. Two more things you need to do before you leave. Make sure that we have your voting and your uh, applications. They will be your, uh, your forms. Be some ushers there and at the back door. That'll be in one plate. In another plate, we at our church give away about $1,000 a month to those people in our community who are in need. This is a very special season because it is the most needy season of the year. Would you allow God to work in your hearts and work in your minds, and work in your pocketbooks to meet some of those needs. And we will live in a very beautiful neighborhood. Would you pray with me? Father God, we are grateful for the neighborhood that you're making us. We are grateful for the gentleness that you wrap your arms around us. We're grateful for the power that raises us from our own little deaths to your own great life. And God, we are grateful for those around us and those who are in us, in whom we live and move and have our being. For it's in Christ's name that we live, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.